sweating. So anyway, uh, now our meeting is being live streamed. So we're all set with that. Um, so just a, a note to everyone, this is being live streamed on Facebook. We are also recording it and we'll publish it on our YouTube channel. So if you do not wish to be recorded, now is your chance to kind of pull on out of the meeting or turn your video off um, just if you have any issues with that. Um, but I don't know, should we give another minute or two, do you think, Alberto? One more minute, okay. We will just wait. And this is, happens to me when I teach too. I, I get really panicky at the sound of silence. I <laughs> it's been such a great <laughs> event and you kept it so lively, all of you, Alberto, amazing too. <laughs> Yeah, we, we added the live stream feature, but I didn't understand that it was going to drop the feed. So sorry about that. <laughs> but I mean, it's it's 104, Lisa. I think we're good to go. Yeah, normally we get a little bit more of Li Shan Huang's amazing music that he shared with us to use for the event, but you'll get to hear it again. So we'll just go ahead and get started. So everyone, hello. I am Lisa Zahabi. If you don't know, um, that is who I am. Welcome to uh, this session here at Shifted Summer Summit. Um, we have an amazing panel discussion for you today. I'm so excited about this. Um, and so I don't wanna speak too long, but just again, a reminder, we are recording. All of these sessions will be published to our YouTube channel, hopefully within 48 hours. We've been pretty quick so far. Um, and then the other thing to note is please do know that the live transcript feature is functioning. If you do need closed captioning, please do turn that on. Um, throw your thoughts uh, into the chat. We will be taking questions and things like that uh, you know, during the session. Um, but what I'm going to do now actually is throw it over to our amazing um, volunteer community moderator, Bernard Caniff who's coming from Iowa State University. Uh, and he is actually gonna go ahead and get us started. So Bern, please take it away. Hello everybody and welcome to the Expanding Narratives uh, and Inclusivity, Inclusivity in Design Classrooms uh, session. Um, I will be the moderator. I'm actually in exile from Iowa right now. I'm in Savannah, Georgia. So, but the, but the background that you see is not Savannah, it's, some theoretical thing that keeps me sane uh, when I'm in the Midwest and hoping for uh, beaches. Anyway, uh, this is going to be uh, uh, an excellent session and I'm proud to be moderating with uh, uh, the esteemed group of presenters that we have today. Um, you know, this covers so many important topics, uh, you know, race and culture and ethics and acceptance and inclusion. So, you know, I'm really proud to be part of, of this group. So before uh, we begin, I'd like uh, to hand it over to uh, the people to, to speak about themselves. Uh, Thank you so much, Bernard. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you guys for joining us today. I'm Kalina Sells. I serve on the steering committee for DEC. So um, I'm so happy to be a part of the panel and also a part of this amazing group. Uh, we'll start with introductions and then go into our presentation. And there will be time at the end for Q&A. So uh, we're really excited to have a conversation about some of these topics. Um, I've been teaching at Tennessee State University for about 13 years. I am a newly tenured associate professor and um, also serving as the chair of the department this year. So lots of changes and um, a lot of learning opportunities, but I'm going to pass it over to uh, the other panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, Farah. Hi everyone, super excited to be here. I'm Farah, I'm a designer and art director um, based in Brooklyn, New York. Valentina, hi. you want to say hi? Yeah. <laughs> hi, everyone. I'm Valentina. Also super excited to be here. Also a designer um, currently in New York. Great. Thank you. I'm Ellen Lupton. Um, I teach at MICA in the graduate and undergraduate programs. And I am co-author with Kalina and Farah and Valentina and three other amazing designers of um, a book called Extra Bold. And we're gonna talk about some of the ideas in the book 
and specifically, you know, engage you all in a conversation about new stories, new narratives that we're all seeking to tell, being inspired to tell in our classrooms. So should I go ahead and grab the screen or you want to say anything else, Kalina? Oh, I think you're good. No, I'm just... All right, I'll take the screen then. So this is our book, which came out in May. And this is my little star map of our amazing author group. And it's been so much fun to get to know you all and collaborate with you, especially after the book came out, how we've become even more of a community and got to know each other more, more deeply um, through events like this. And here's a little fly through to give you a sense of what the book is like, what it feels like. It's very visual. It's full of illustrations and graphics and fonts by all kinds of people. And it looks at theory and history and also workplace practices um, to try to be a kind of field guide or introduction to thinking about design in our moment and thinking about how to navigate design as an idea, as a theory, as a profession, as, as a way of thinking, um, and to kind of try to start you know, new conversations about that. Um, and the book, in addition to having seven co-authors, has dozens of other contributors. So these are some posters and, and graphics in the book about inclusive design and about um, facing uh, the pandemic and changes in the workplace that are really new, uh, as well as historic uh, issues in the workplace. And the idea for the book actually came from two students. <laughs> um, I had the pleasure of meeting Farah and Valentina in 2018 when they did their senior project at Pratt. And I'm gonna let them take over and tell you what they did. And just to say that their um, kind of activism and awareness as students was just so incredibly inspiring. And so we're really excited today to have this panel really feature them and um, what, what, they, what students bring to this conversation and how they've opened my eyes for sure. So, um, so go ahead, Farah and Valentina. Great. So Valentina and I, we were seniors at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn a few years ago. And we basically were asking ourselves, where are the women? Um, while at the same time, kind of calling to action that we are here. <laughs> because while we were sitting in our classrooms full of incredibly diverse classmates, we were almost always being taught both by and about white men. I mean, quite literally our last year in choosing a senior thesis professor um, for graphic design, we didn't even have the option to have a woman. Um, so we were kind of baffled by this experience and we decided to take matters into our own hands and we created this campaign called Led by Example and it took shape in two parts, an installation um, on our department floor and also a panel discussion. Oh, sorry. Can you go back one? Yeah, baby. There you go. Is that right? So as, yeah. Yes. So as Farah mentioned, um, we had an um, installation called Missing Pages, where we discovered, compiled, and collected work the work and contribution of 10 different women designers. Some of them were immigrants, some of them were mothers, but all of them were really inspirational to us in the fact that they really shaped graphic design. And we sourced um, all of this information from a variety of articles and books. And we pieced together, we pieced all of these things together to create a reconciled history textbook page. So you can go to the next slide. And our intention was to quite literally demarginalize this group of incredible women by taking them off of what would regularly be hung up against a wall and printing these posters at a really obnoxious, exaggerated scale 
this room is just, it was just a walkway between two departments. And so we wanted to just force every student and faculty to be interrupted by these stories and to, um, yeah, to, to learn about some of the history and graphic design that was totally missing from our, from our classrooms. And so then we also had this like resource corner in the installation where we had a variety of articles and reading materials. And what we really wanted to do was to encourage people to compile a source of resources like we did and really inspire like a library of your own resources. And so, and then the second part is we were really interested in hearing about women who were in the industry at the time. And that's where we met Ellen and we reached out to Tracy Ma and Natasha Jen and Carly Ayers. And we had a really candid, interesting conversation. And the energy in this room was actually what inspired this book. So Ellen, you can take it away from here. Totally, that was such an incredible evening. And it was like the, the class session that you never had, you just organized it yourself. <laughs> and it was so cool because students and um, young designers and designers my age <laughs> came from all over New York and even from other cities to come and, and see this event. And I just remember being so inspired and thinking, wow, wouldn't it be cool to create a book that would address these issues, but would do it not from a theoretical or strictly theoretical point of view, but from like a practical point of view and kind of speak to the concerns that people had that night. And I think us as educators, sometimes we become feeling sort of ins insulated in our classroom and sort of all focused on skills and, and ideas related to projects in class. But these students and, and other designers who were in the room that night, they were concerned about like being immigrants or about being a trans designer and not being able to live their identity in the workplace and having to like be a false person at work. And those are issues that I think as educators, we often don't think of as what we teach about in school. And yet there was this incredible hunger in that room that night to talk about it. Um, and so I thought what would be really cool <laughs> is not just to write a book from my perspective or even from the perspective of other educators, you know, from, from our AIGA world, but to actually collaborate with these um, recent graduates <laughs> and to try to create a project that really incorporated their point of view. Um, so we started building a team and the team grew over time and, and attracted more contributors and, and, and co-authors. But the initial group was myself and my friend, Jenny Tobias, who's a scholar and artist and illustrator and Farah and Valentina. And Jenny and I made these sample pages and sample illustrations from, from the book and created like a whole portfolio of ideas to share with our new mentors. <laughs> and we were just so privileged and so excited to have these mentors who were the age of, you know, like my daughter <laughs> and to, to learn from them how to communicate better. Um, and so this was one of the first illustrations that we sent and maybe Valentina or Farah, you could, <laughs> share how you reacted when you saw this illustration. <laughs> yeah, I remember, I think our feedback was, it was um, maybe targeting like a younger audience, kind of reminding us of like the puberty, puberty books that you get when you're like American Girl doll kind of situation. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was a really good crit for us <laughs> middle-aged ladies. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had it all, all wrong. And then you very kindly put together these portfolios of inspiration for us, just like, you know, a teacher might do in a design classroom to say, here, look at Paul Rand, you know, <laughs> but you were like, here, look at 
Sarah and Drayson and look at this, you know, illustrator who is really speaking to your um, your generation and your community. Um, and we were really blown away by the work of Ben Evans. Can you tell us a little bit about this work that you shared with us? Sure, these were artists that we were looking at, being inspired by, it's a few years ago now, but Ben was someone we went to school with and we felt like their illustrations were also just very honest. And, you know, we love that they were showing body hair and um, maybe activities we wouldn't show in our book, but lots of bongs in here, lots of chilling out. And we felt like the <laughs> environments were kind of speaking to their lives, their age, um, yeah. Yeah, so, so Jenny and I looked at this and we're like, we will never be that cool, you know? And once I see that bong, I can't unsee it. You know? But we tried um, and we, you know, revised our, our illustrations. You also shared with us like fashion advice, which I have not applied to my actual life, but <laughs> that we tried to apply to some of the illustrations in the book. Um, and so this was like generation two of how the book was, was going to look. Um, and we think it's a lot better. And you'll notice, like, for example, the fashion is directly inspired <laughs> by the lookbook that you provided to us. So, so that was really cool for us to, um, to learn and to kind of reverse the learning process in a way that is super healthy and something I want to uh, do do more of. Um, I think Josh is not here, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Kalina to to talk. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I teach at Tennessee State University, which is an HBCU, um, and HBCU is a historically black college or university. So I serve as predominantly black students, and many of my students are from really urban areas of cities like Memphis and Chicago, Atlanta. And early in my teaching, I started to notice that the students were really drawn to certain color palettes and textures and a visual aesthetic that was really bold. And I, I, I began to do some research in terms of, you know, where we develop our visual preferences. Um, and if we go to the next slide, um, I started to assess um, what it looks like in an urban area, what it looks like in an inner city area, and even a low income area and the textures and the colors and the graffiti and the, and um, how that work sort of um, becomes a part of our, our visual language. And we pull from that when we're designing. Um, if we go to the next slide, I even started to notice in my own work, the ways that I was, personally really influenced by urban elements um, and then becoming really intentional um, over the past, I would say couple of years um, to introduce those elements into my own design work. And so even in the illustration to the right, uh, the graffiti sort of abstracted graffiti pattern uh, was intentional behind the figure and even the earring stud in his ear and sort of not wanting to shy away from, you know, visual language um, that reminds me of sort of my own upbringing. Can I ask you something, Kalina? Yeah. That I've been curious about. Okay. <laughs> Was there like a, a process of unlearning there? Yeah, for like sure. A, I, yeah. yeah. I, I've spent, I mean, I was educated, you know, uh, in Swiss design and, you know, sort of, you know, kind of traditional uh, international typographic style and all of that and spent many of my early, I would say, design years trying to um, unlearn my natural aesthetic <laughs> preferences and, and mm -hmm. wanting my work very much to blend into um, what I would consider the mainstream. And so yeah. I had to really think about that. And so the work that I've done recently and the teaching that I've done recently really just reflects um, a, a new ideology, you know, and sort of a new point of view uh, about that. So yeah, I had to be intentional about um, the way that I'm presenting myself and my work. Yeah, yeah. Kalina, it's sort of, um... I mean, you touched on something interesting then about sort of the difference between looking down as the Swiss style, um, yeah. looking out, mm. and looking up. 
you know, which is what you're doing. And sort of the graffiti uh, that you showed, I mean, is reminiscent of East and West Baltimore, uh, where I sort of cut my teeth. But yeah. I mean, that is 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 effective visual communication yeah, in the best sense of it. You know, as an outsider, we may not know what's being communicated, but the community does. Yeah. The community does. I love that point. Yeah, and there's a graffiti artist slash designer, art director, painter uh, named Say Adams, C-E-Y Adams, who I think is brilliant uh, in, his, in the way that he uses um, graffiti and lettering and color. Um, so yeah, so I try to be influenced and kind of inspired by um, artists like that, that are not afraid, thank you, Mina, <laughs> that are not afraid to um, show who they are, you know, in their work, so yeah. Um, one of one of my favorite illustrations in the book is this here. Um, I thought a lot about, and I've been thinking a lot about um, the ways that are, even our socioeconomic upbringing can impact the ways in which we design. And so imagine if you grew up well off where having lots of money was normal and you were asked to design a bank, our logo for a bank, you might opt for a representation of that that's sort of corporate and quiet and simplified, maybe like the example on the right. If you grew up uh, similar to me and my students, uh, many of my students, not all of them, uh, where maybe um, your view of wealth or your understanding of wealth is very different, you might opt for a representation of that that matches sort of those idealistic, you know, idealistic feelings. So it's gold and it's a little bit, you know, flashier. Um, and so just the way that we understand the world uh, comes out in the way that we design. Um, and so I, it's perfectly illustrated here uh, in the book. And I, and I like to use this example in class as well. Um, on the next few slides, I think there's a series of images and I wanna challenge just everyone to think about your reaction to the image uh, and then sort of, you know, is it positive, is it negative, is it neutral? And then after that, kind of consider maybe why you have that reaction. Um, if you grew up again with lots of money or you're currently doing okay, your reaction to this image, you know, will be very different from someone who's struggling to make ends meet. Um, and I think that's something we should consider not only as we're reviewing work that students are doing, but as we're creating, you know, work as well. Uh, the next- Does anyone throw a reaction into the yeah. chat? <laughs> Like my initial reaction was cash. <laughs> like, yeah. oh no, I haven't touched cash <laughs> yeah. in so long. So, and I love uh, Zachary put capitalism. Yeah, it's. I mean, everyone was sort of, you know, kind of think of different things. <laughs> Some good responses. Um, but yeah, I've, I've been in places. I'll be, you know, in, in my life where I've <laughs> struggled financially. So, you know, where when you see images, different people see images. They they'll sort of think of different things. Um, I think the next. Yeah, and so if you if you do that same sort of experiment, right, and you take a second to think about your reaction to this, although it's shot beautifully, right, and it's a beautiful image. Um, if you are recently engaged, you might view this very differently than someone who is recently divorced, right? <laughs> and so, <laughs> or just paid uh, for the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, you know, and so these are just examples, simple examples, and then we can go. I think there's two more, maybe. I think we all feel differently about this image today than we may have pre-COVID, right? And just the idea of traveling, the idea of, you know, some people see this as a, a burden if you're traveling a lot for work. Some people see it as freedom, you know, uh, <laughs> first thought, where's his mask? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, these are conjuring up different ideas. And I think there's one more and I'll kind of be quiet on the next one a little bit, give you a chance to look at it and think about it. Mm. So if there are any thoughts or any kind of first reactions, I'd love to sort of see them in the chat. Don't be shy. <laughs> it's sort of like, you know, 
we've just come out of a, an administration that was all about exclusion mm. and isolation and hate. And, you know, and, and then on top of that, you get on top of the cake, then you get the sort of COVID isolation. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, coming out of that in terms of designers or students into this brave new world and this wonderful topic that uh, discussion comes with its own sense of uh, tension, you know, and yeah. coming back and flying or touching people or sitting down and in conversation, I think, you know, the, and this, I mean, is sort of like part of that sort of yeah. past or part of the present. I don't know. A lot of things came to the surface mm -hmm. that, that were already, you know, hidden uh, and demonstrably came forward under the last administration. Yeah. And we all, you know, might view the previous <laughs> and current administration differently, right? And so that's another kind of point of difference. So, um, yeah, I think my, so um, just a little transparency about myself. I live in the South. I've been born and raised in the South. And so this immediately, you know, it conjures up the South. It's a small town. It's, you know, um, and I had a conversation with my mother-in-law, who is a white woman in her 60s from a really small town. And we were talking about an image sort of similar to this. And she um, had really kind of positive, nostalgic vibes and was kind of, just reminiscing on her experience growing up and how, you know, it was really nice and lovely. And I thought, wow, that's so interesting how we will have really drastically sort of different feelings about certain things. When I see this, I uh, don't feel welcomed. <laughs> and, you know, and it might be a part of growing up in the South and sort of being afraid of certain small towns. And, and I think that, you know, the, the imagery and the colors and, and, um, and it, certainly photography will will do that for us. You know, um, I don't want anyone to feel like there's a right or wrong answer here. I think that it just sort of brings up, I think, a really interesting point that we all should consider, you know, especially as we're teaching and critiquing our students work, um, that everyone has a different experience and everyone views things differently. You know, my mother-in-law's experience, you know, um, is valid and real and, and certainly meaningful for her. And so, um, yeah, so I just think that this sort of experience or experiment, you know, helps us to understand that a little bit. There's some really great comments in the chat. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to take too I much understand. time here, but yeah, do you want to say something, Ellen? Well, I think Alberto talks about for, you know, people who don't live in the U.S., yeah. right? Then oh, it feels yes. like a Hollywood image and like a almost idealized cowboy movie set. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine that for an immigrant in the, in the US with all the pick, pickup trucks, it might um, give a very different view, different yeah. point of view about um, what is being represented. It's kind of amazing that every car parked on the street <laughs> truck, yeah. is a pickup truck. <laughs> I, I'm sure that inspired this photograph. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <Some> degree. <laughs> okay. So cool. um, maybe we can, and just if, yeah, I'll talk a little bit more before I sort of pass the mic over um, on why it's important to stretch the canon. Um, and if we go, yeah. So I think that, um, I think about my experience, I attended, um, I attended TSU in undergrad, the same HBCU that I'm currently teaching. And so one of my art history professors, um, she taught us about the West African Adinkra symbols. And it was the first time I'd ever heard of them, ever seen them. And they're so beautifully designed. They're, you know, balanced and, you know, there's, you know, symmetry and then there's radial balance and all these things that we teach about. Um, in design, but oftentimes not from examples um, that are from um, other parts of the world or cultures outside of sort of, you know, European countries. And so we hear a lot about Swiss design and, you know, again, international typographic style and Bauhaus. Uh, but the problem with um, these sort of overemphasis of, of those movements is that it communicates that only good design is sort of derived from those very specific places. And um, that's just certainly not true. 
when I was growing up, I listened to a lot of um, hip hop and R&B. And so I thought about, you know, if I look at this image of the clothing, the oversized clothing of the group Escape, and it's scaled down or simplified to these shapes that I'm learning about, you know, um, scale and proportion, right? It was like an early introduction to that. Um, the next slide is another example, you know, the colorful uh, clothing of salt and pepper, you know, kind of deconstructed into these shapes and colors um, remind us of a Mondrian painting or, you know, or something that we celebrate in sort of the traditional canon. And so um, I think it's interesting to think about that we're all learning about design and art and, and all of that, um, but maybe not from the same canon. Um, I love groups like Afrocobra uh, because they're 1960s artist collective from Chicago, but what I specifically love about them and I use in my teaching as an example to my students is that they broke away from the mainstream art world uh, with a really intentional uh, practice and they created a set of guiding principles uh, that were meant to communicate um, things to their specific culture and their specific cultural group. And so um, there's a quote, I believe on the next slide that I love by Afrocobra artist, Michael Harris. And it says, rather than squeezing into the canon, we're saying, let's make the canon more elastic so that it includes what we do and who we are. So it's not really about, you know, saying that there's anything wrong with, you know, Bauhaus or any of the other movements, but it's saying, let's stretch it. Let's, let's include other voices and other narratives um, into the discussion. Um, and then just uh, really quickly, I've been able to uh, run a series called Beyond the Bauhaus through AIGSDEC. Um, and uh, it's a collaborative project written by uh, a variety of uh, design educators and their stories from underrepresented cultural and social groups or stories that we don't really typically hear about in the canon. So this one's about Afrocobra. Um, the next slide, I think, um, G's Ben Quilters, a, a group of uh, women in uh, Alabama who developed these gorgeous quilts, beautifully designed, but they were untrained. And so uh, their story is amazing. Uh, and then the next, um, Ali Place uh, wrote this wonderful article about women, you know, who code. And so there's a there's a, a really great collection, and it's and the series is growing. So uh, it's one way that I've been trying to contribute to the conversation about expanding the canon. But I think there's so many ways that we can do that. Yeah, I, th thank you, and I, I think it's really inspiring that you're taking what you're doing in the classroom, but then sharing it so that other educators can benefit from it too, right? Because we're all hungry for these resources <laughs> of telling these, these bigger stories. Um, and a lot of it is happening in our design history courses. Uh, I teach with the amazing Brockett Horn. We teach graphic design history at MICA together and are trying to stretch the canon and t tell some, some new stories. But I wanna emphasize that it's not just about teaching design history, um, that these narratives, actually every single design educator has to take part in this. So if you're sitting in your office with a student and you wanna hand them a book from your shelf to inspire them with an example of graphic design or art or photography. And all the books <laughs> are showing, you know, the work of white men. You need to get more books on your shelf, right? You need to have these references for when we talk to students about what design is and um, what the practice looks like and has looked like. Uh, this is something that happens every day in, when we teach graphic design, not just in a history class. Um, and so I love the, the People's Design Archive is so cool um, because it's, you know, broadening the stories that we can tell and refer our students to and also learn from ourselves. So I think for everybody here, um, we are all learning. You know, Kalina is learning all these stories and, and relearning, you know, how we were taught and then trying to do that with our students, but also with other educators by creating 
resources like this um, or resources like, like our book, which has a whole history section. But really the message in our book is to, um, is to show that these histories are being created by graphic designers and by collectors and by people like Andy Campbell, who's documenting the queer graphic design from the perspective of an art critic. He's not a designer, um, but people, you know, studying these um, phenomena from inside their community. Uh, and I think that's the big message of the People's Design Archive, <laughs> right? Is that, that we have to kind of do it ourselves. Um, and that that history is really infinite, right? We'll never be able to fit it all inside one book. This is an incredible essay by Tanvi Sharma, who a, was a recent graduate of, of MICA. We asked her to write a piece about feminism in India um, and the incredible posters uh, that have been created in that context. And this is history that I don't know, I have no access to. Um, and so just trying to, to broaden those stories is really important. This is work by Angel Decora, incredible Native American designer who did these beautiful typographic title pages um, in 1907, each one interpreting the design language of a different Native community. Um, incredible that she was doing this at that time. Um, and really creating a kind of model for, uh, for creating this um, new design language based in, in her own, own culture, but also studying the culture of, of other native people. And I wanted to say something <laughs> about the Bauhaus too, because the Bauhaus is the, the mythic point of origin. You know, so we talk about beyond the Bauhaus, throw the Bauhaus under the bus, you know, too much Bauhaus. <laughs> um, and, you know, of course I'm uh, utterly fascinated by the Bauhaus and, you know, don't wanna throw it under the bus. Um, and, and rather I want to look at other stories we can tell about the Bauhaus and to examine, you know, why is it so important, right? Why? did this tiny art school that was active for about 10 years become the mythic point of origin for all modern typography, architecture, and product design. <laughs> it's kind of wild. And one of the reasons it became so important is because they had graphic designers on staff who made posters and books and exhibitions that built that myth. Um, so graphic design is part of the machine that made the Bauhaus this larger than life, outsized, mythologized um, entity, but also then to look at the origin of this visual language of abstraction and to see that we wouldn't have any modern art without African art and that the lineage of um, of cubism to modern architecture and graphic design is completely reliant on um, African art and Picasso and others, you know, so discovering, right? <laughs> encountering something they hadn't seen before and being shocked into creating their, their language, their interpretation of it. Um, and so, you know, this is really important that when we teach modernism to show that this modern language doesn't just come out of Euclidean geometry, <laughs> it comes out of African art, you know, directly, not indirectly, <laughs> but, but very directly and, and deliberately. And then also that to be careful not to talk about the Bauhaus is one thing. Because when we do that, we tell our students that good design is one thing and that all design in the 20th century was moving towards this one moment, right, of Helvetica and it was all over after that. <laughs> and that instead, if you look at every art movement, including the Bauhaus, as containing um, divergent voices, conflicting voices, um, competing voices, 
This is work by Friedel Dicker, who was a woman at the Bauhaus and was the most talented and amazing student of Johannes Itten. And she collaborated with him on this series of letterpress prints, which are a unique contribution to typographic history. Um, and she did the typography. She took his text and she created this typography. Um, and we can see her work process in this beautiful print. And she's a part of the Bauhaus that gets erased when we talk about the Bauhaus being one thing. And when we say throw the Bauhaus under the bus, we're throwing Friedel Dicker under the bus and Lucia Maholi and Mariana Brandt and Ani Albers and Gunther Stutzel and lots of other people who actually do have fascinating stories and, and fascinating contributions. Um, Friedel Dicker's story is especially moving because after she left the Bauhaus, um, she became an art educator as well as a designer and an artist and ultimately went to the Theresienstadt ghetto and concentration camp where she taught children art. And the art that she taught them was directly inspired by what she learned at the Bauhaus from Paul Clay and Johannes Itten. And she herself was murdered at Auschwitz, but thousands of these drawings by her children have been preserved, the children that she taught. And some of those children survived and emigrated to the US and founded the field of um, art therapy. <laughs> So there is a legacy of the Bauhaus that is often overlooked and that is very much alive today in a culture of, of healing and using design and art for an incredibly um, positive purpose. And um, I, I think that you know, we just have so many great stories that can be discovered um, within uh, the canon, right? So I, I love what Kalina talks about in, in stretching the canon uh, and, and making it accommodate uh, more stories and different stories. Yeah, I think um, another thing that we were thinking about um, recently is sort of, you know, how the pandemic has really uh, prompted us to consider the differences between equity and equality. And so um, in considering that, I've reflected on um, the experience of teaching, again, um, students who are generally first-generation college students or many first-generation college students and their response to the pandemic when everyone was forced to go virtual the first time. And so almost immediately I began receiving really frantic emails from students concerned with how they would be able to complete their assignments because they didn't have laptops and, you know, there's no iPad for Pro Procreate. And so they were, you know, generally, um, you know, really nervous about that. Um, and so what the pandemic essentially did was, or the um, virtual kind of situation, is it, is it pushed these students who are already first generation college students are already probably uh, behind um, economically even further behind. And, and so I think about you know, that journey that students have on their way through college and how critical it is to have access. And so if you're only able to work on your portfolio while you're in the computer lab, you know, during class time, you're not gonna be able to put in the necessary hours that it takes to really refine your, you know, your technical skills. And so when we're talking about equality and equity, um, you know, the focus should really be on equity because it, it allows us to look at individual needs. Um, and create solutions based on that instead of sort of um, equality, which suggests that everyone is sort of coming to the table, you know, in the same way. And so this illustration is done by uh, Jenny Tobias in the book. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's a conversation, not just about race, but also there's other kind of forms of um, equity. And I think Ellen talks uh, or wrote about confidence equity in a really beautiful way. Um, so Ellen, did you want to? 
Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is a, um, a little story about how a particular illustration changed in our book over time. And the story that we were telling was a situation that I think many of you have had in your classrooms <laughs> where there's a student who is so confident and has so much energy and always has an answer to everything. Um, and that student is like often taking up all the oxygen. Um, and other students may be struggling to be heard, um, may just check out, right? This, I, I love this person just lying on the floor. <laughs> and so to, to illustrate this, uh, you know, Jenny started with, with this image of this wonderful, energetic young man um, in the middle of the room, um, surrounded by, by others who are kind of trying to, to find their, their place in this overwhelmed, you know, hair professor um, at the bottom, like, you know, what do I do? Um, and, you know, we spent some time thinking about and, and working on this illustration and giving the guy all this, this language. Um, but Jenny got really uncomfortable with how we were kind of pinning this behavior on this, this type of the white male student. And, and to us, it, it, it went against the view of an inclusivity that we wanted to create in, in the book, which actually includes lots of men and <laughs> male contributors and, um, it, it is trying not to be exclusionary. Um, and so Jenny changed the image to this, <laughs> which, you know, was, was a way to kind of depersonalize it and also make it more personal. Like this elephant is really a very lovable elephant. You know, we all love that energetic student. Um, we may find ourselves speaking to that student because they're so engaged and so into everything. But as educators, we also have to find ways to, um, other ways to participate. And maybe that's something we can talk about in the discussion um, portion. Like what, what do you do um, when we uh, are overwhelmed by the elephant in the room? And that may prompt me for a moment to just, um, stop sharing for a second and maybe take a pause and see what questions are, are coming in. And I saw there was a lot of uh, comments about the, the canon and all these topics. So we'd love to hear from you. And we do have a really cool activity to do with you as well. But Kalina, what do you want to do at this, at this jun juncture? Yeah, maybe we can take a couple of the questions from the chat. Um... I don't know if maybe we can yeah, maybe this burn it. Yeah, let's yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah let me just see what's uh, there. I mean, I have a question uh, from the earlier presentation. When you did, when the students did that exhibition, um, what was the feedback, if any, from the white men, the teachers? Did it did it change the behavior or the perceptions or or, or what happened? I think it was widely. I mean, no, I wouldn't say widely. I had both some good and bad experiences. There was one professor who's kind of like been there for years, been teaching the same thing. Everybody knows him. And he had come up to us after um, and mentioned that he changed one of his assignments where previously each person was assigned a designer, a typeface designer to create a zine about their bio and about them. And he opened it up to be that they got to choose um, who they wanted to do. I mean, that's a really simple kind of like change for him to make. But he said mm -hmm. that it was an incredible experience for him because he got to learn about designers he hadn't heard of. And the students were able to be like extra engaged because they were really interested in the people that they had researched that they wanted to bring to the table. Um, so that was a beautiful like comment mm -hmm. that came from one of those classic professors that we had had, <laughs> we had always been teaching the same group of people. He had like that list that was always being given out. Um, and I think that was a small shift on, on his part. I mean, it, it put the, it made, it made a it so big that, shift. Sarah. I mean, it's, I That's guess though, good. yeah, I, I think the, the result of that shift is definitely huge. Um, but it seems like such a simple thing to do, but yeah, I remember Valentina and I, even in, in, in an illustration class, 
we had the professor hand us like a 10 page packet of illustrators to watch out for. And I think, yeah. I don't even think we could count a single woman on there. Yeah. It was, it's just, um, but that was a really positive thing that that one man came up to us and was like, look, I changed this thing and the result was actually kind of wonderful. So I think something important that we should also mention is that, yes, we had a lot of positive feedback, but we even had negative feedback from a female professor. So like, that's also really part of the equation. Like not all people are on the same page. And so what was in, the negative? Valentina? So in the process of um, researching and like coming up with our project, we did a bunch of surveys with both students and professors and just people working like women working in the industry. And one of the comments from one of the female professors was that our project really wasn't relevant and it wasn't needed. And it wasn't really a problem in the industry, which is completely untrue. And we were kind of shocked and confused that someone would say that. But, you know, here we are today on this panel discussing this. So <laughs> it is what it is. You, you know, and I think it's sort of like somebody's mentioned about uh, agency and student agency is important. And I think, you know, for me, it's sort of like as as an educator is, you know, getting out of the way of the students and allowing them to, to discuss and share and create. I mean, there's been some of the most um, rewarding experiences and I must commend the both of you for being gutsy and brave and, and doing that. I mean, that was such a brave risk, I mean, to take and, you know, kudos to, to the both of you. It's quite an amazing story. Anyway, does anybody want to sort of take this idea of what agency or the importance of agency? You know, is one of the questions that come up. I mean, sometimes sort of like we don't, design educators, we don't realize how much power that we have to close people down. You know, even, even, even you know, Ellen was saying about the books and, um, you know, we don't realize how we're sort of closing out when some students are outspoken and can speak out against uh, instructors, but many do not. And I think we do, uh, we can do irreparable damage from that. Bernard, I think one reaction to the agency thing, I mean, so Farah tells the story about the teacher then just telling students to choose who they want. But there might be a middle ground because maybe you want to point students to some unexpected people um, that they might not find in a quick Google search, which will bring up, you know, pentagram, pentagram, and pentagram. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, you know, to be able to send them to um, the Beyond the Bauhaus web website articles, for example, to give people some hints of where they can find unexpected material or go to the People's Design Archive and research something that they find there um, could, could be helpful. So some kind of mix between agency and, and directing people. I'd like to ask a question from the chat that, or address one of the questions. I think there were a couple of people that were mentioning the pink elephant and sort of saying, you know, is there something kind of wrong with being the person that's like talking a lot and excited or, um, and, and what's, I guess, I like the way that you um, talk about how people gain confidence and how certain people um, have acquired confidence and some people don't have it. And so sort of, you know, framing that conversation around the pink elephant, do you mind? Yeah, kind of, yeah. yeah. So, so we, we talk about an idea I call confidence equity. And you know, often the idea of confidence um, is something that we think of as an individual virtue or skill. And that confidence is something that we, we each can develop in, an, in, in ourselves, right? Just like a muscle that you might develop. And of course, there's, there's some truth to that. You can build your confidence and expose yourself to situations, right? That might give you anxiety or whatever and go ahead and do it. But the confidence is also something that other people invest in us, right? So I express my confidence in Bernard as the moderator. Right? <laughs> I invest my, my trust in him. And so mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're raised, always people always being confident that you'll, you'll do well, you'll succeed, you'll um, you know, take a certain path in life. 
that's an advantage. Um, and if some people have to work harder, right? They might not be expected to win the game or get picked or, you know, be the top in the spelling bee or whatever it might be. Um, and so, yeah, the, the pink elephant, we love the pink elephant. This is like often the best student, right? The person that just always wants to contribute and is so deeply engaged. But then what other strategies can we have to help um, build the confidence of others? So for example, you know, I've loved it in Zoom world that there's so many other ways to contribute. Like people can write a comment in the chat, they don't, speaking isn't the only option. And um, so, yeah, there's nothing wrong with the pink, the pink elephant is not a bad person, <laughs> but your students will be frustrated if the pink elephant is the only one who ever gets to say anything. I have a comment to add to that. I saw someone in the chat is talking about, you know, people need to feel agency, relatedness and competency to be self-motivated and I think our project kind of touched like what we were missing from our design education was seeing people like us and that also builds confidence like knowing that there's women women of color in the industry succeeding like makes it so that students can be like okay that could be me one day and like researching those people and how did they get there and what paths like got them to get there is also helpful for students beautiful And if anyone wants to unmute to ask a question, I think that's totally fine. Does anyone want to do that? I, I would. Oh, sure. Uh, uh, hey there, I'm Nikki. Um, I just put in the chat about, so I was just wondering when I'm teaching history of graphic design in undergrad, part of what we also have to teach is of course, how to do academic writing. So you're teaching the skill along with the research. I think you all know that. And so whenever I've tried to include um, just even a short essay with proper academic citation for underrepresented designers. The thing is, the problem is, is that they haven't been written about that much yet. And so I just wonder, is that I, I love all the sources I've gotten today, but have any of you run into that problem and how do you solve it? Help. Well, I mean, I would, I would say that um, you have to broaden what the, research requirement is so you know I've seen classes where you you're to get the good grade you have to have a book from the library a physical book and that's immediately excludes people who have not been written about in physical books <laughs> and so just allowing research to be more diverse that it, it could um, focus on what's happening visually in the piece. And let's say it's a graffiti. And so the person also researches something about the history of graffiti and the art market for graffiti, or there's lots of academic research around graffiti and it might not be around that artist, but it would, um, still provide intellectual context for the artwork. Thank you, that is a simple solution and so, uh, yeah, thank you. That's huge, thank you. Would so I have a question you? for anybody on the panel uh, and I threw this at, uh, uh, at Bernard and a, a few other folks. Hi, hi Bernard. Um, hey. So my question was to all of you, so uh, where does this endeavor, or more specifically, these types of endeavors need to go next? There are many ways to answer this purposefully open-ended question, and where should we not go? I really like that you're asking where should we not go, because I, I'm interested in saying having fewer no's. Right, like more yes, less no. That if someone wants to study the Bauhaus, you know, or Helvetica, those are fascinating topics and have huge, you know, huge academic and philosophical, whatever, tendrils all through society. Um, but to provide other, other, 
um, directions for people in addition to those. So that that's my my gut. But I know there will be other other um, feelings here that may be more radical than mine, right? To I'd love to hear more. Truly radical. decolonize this shit, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I think right? one of the things that that. And I'll, I'll very quickly put on my dialectic editor hat here for just a second. I was so happy, Ellen, to hear you say more yet, um, uh, more yes, less no. I, I wish we would see more submissions. Uh, you know, we, we accept things in eight different categories. I wish we would see more that are broader. It seems like we see a lot of things that it looks like people are trying to fit them. Uh, into, well, I've, I've got to run down this shoot. If it's a research paper, it's got to be like this, or I've got to run down this shoot. If it's theoretical speculation, yeah. hey, it's speculation. It means you get to speculate. So you've got other opportunities to, I'm doing this with my hands, to open this up. Um, and so again, if, if we, uh, we may have to get some bumper stickers and t-shirts issued with that whole more yes, uh, less no line on them, I think, uh, as we go forward. Do you so think how that, about some radical stuff from some of the rest of you guys? Can I also just jump in real quick on that too? Like, I think, um, I think writing can feel, I enjoy writing, but I think writing You're can very feel really, good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I think it can feel really intimidating, um, to a lot of people just in general. Um, but especially I would say, and I speak from my own experience, not to exclude other people's experience, but just, you know, I mean, I'm a first generation college student and I was always a really good student and I enjoyed writing, um, but I didn't understand research. I didn't understand it. Even as I made my way through grad school and MFA and da, 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 and teaching, it's, you see some of the submission requirements and you get scared and you think, you know, I don't know what this means and I don't know how to do it. So, so maybe it goes back to Ellen's point about um, diversifying sort of like what's required, you know, maybe I think writing is certainly obviously valid and uh, one, one way of sharing stories and, and histories. And, um, I don't know, maybe there's other maybe types we should of do submission. TikTok this year, <laughs> you know, like do your report in TikTok and share uh, it with the whole world. <laughs> right. But yeah, yeah but I don't that's know. That's the whole skill of storytelling <laughs> yeah. and narrative. That, like, right. We also oh, accept yeah. visual narratives. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So that's that's a whole category in and of itself. If um, so, there there are uh, there other are other ways. Yeah, um, that might be a part of. Yeah, I don't know. That's sort of what comes to mind. Is you know maybe pushing out that there's other there are other ways that there's the visual narratives and there's other kind of ways to contribute. Um, yeah, but that's just my kind of. I, I don't see. know if Kenneth Fitzgerald's on this, but one of the things he likes to say is, "Tell us a good story." Mm. To take this one step backwards, uh, we um, we had this interesting conversation in the AIGA book uh, book club the other day, and it was this idea on how to make writing more accessible to our students, and we came up with this idea of something like a joy writing, like allowing students to write, not as a documentary style, but kind of just to write about what they like, about what they see, that will allow them to uh, consider writing as a tool that they have. Um, same way as they can take photographs and draw and everything else. So when they do get out of school or when they do have something to say in writing, they will have the, the kind of license and also the kind of comfort that, yes, I've done this before, this is acceptable, and um, it can kind of join the rest of the outputs that they already have. Yeah, that's great because young people are writing all the time in text messaging. <laughs> And it, it really is a medium of communication. I also find that young people read all the time, that, you know, my, my kids and people their age are reading the news so much more than I did when I was 22 because we had to pay money to buy the New York Times. And now they, people are just, I think, so much more informed and are actually reading a lot. Just might not be academic reading. Yeah, I think we're all sort of touching on this sort of thing about empowerment, various forms of empowerment is leaving students fly, you know, flying, helping, helping them get where they want to be. 
I think Ellen's yes and, and, and more yes and less no is part of that. And then you know, the <clears throat> story about um, letting students write about what they want to and not think that writing is only um, academic sort of personal narratives. But I saw somebody where I think it was Elio put a comment in the chat about um, students needing structure. And I guess that gets to my like in between just letting people choose and, and guiding them to some pathways. I wonder if Elio, you wanted to, um, to share your comment with the group. That students, I think our students really freak out when they don't know what's expected. When my, from my experience is when I leave it very open, they, especially the ones who are uh, the lower levels, they are, they use this word confused. And I always tell them, don't be confused. Just tell me what is it that you do not, you don't, you don't understand. I always blame myself saying that if my accent was the, Cause of confusion, just let me know. I have no problem uh, repeating things. So when I give them some guidelines, then they want to do something else. I tell them, please inform me about this. So then you can follow your own guidelines that you are developing. So then you don't end up having something that was done at the very last minute with no uh, thought process. So at least I'm trying to replicate what the industry expects because at the end they're going to graduate and work for somebody else. And then you know, at the beginning, probably if they are not entrepreneurs and then um, they are going to be quite probably shot if somebody says, no, I don't like this, do it the way I, I did it. And then they are not going to understand that that's not how I was taught. So, you know, I explained that, that perspective as well, just to have some structure. Otherwise, they have so many things out there that they tend to be, what do I do? And that's what takes a lot of time for them to come up with. Great point, Silvio. Yeah, I, I totally feel that. I remember feeling that way as a student. And I think back, back to Nikki's comment too, I mean, funny enough, I replied to you in the chat and I said that libraries have a lot of resources. And then Ellen was like, libraries aren't writing. I mean, the books haven't been written. And I think that that's like at the intersection of this comment, which is um, there, there are a lot of existing, I mean, we've been, people have been sending links in the chat this whole time. And there's tons, like Valentina and I, we weren't finding what we wanted to learn about from the professors who were creating the material. <laughs> but also from our, from Meg's history of graphic design, that huge, big, fat textbook, right? So we spent so much time in the library and there are lots of existing, yeah. <laughs> there are lots of existing books. I don't think that we should make students like go and find things that haven't even been written about. Cause I think that is a huge undertaking. Um, and I mean, that'd be wonderful, but there, there are already a lot of existing things outside of the canon that are not being taught by the professors or by the school, by the curriculum. Um, and that's like, that's how we found out about those women. We were, we were so shocked to find out about all of those women who shaped design, who we had not heard about in our classrooms and in our history books. Um, but we found them through books in our library. So I think, <laughs> Nanki, like that's, I mean, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't need to be a, a whole, like find people who have never been written about and, and find the words to write about them, but that's existing. And then I totally feel you on, um, Elio, on like the, the problem of the no structure. I, I, and, and especially with going into the real world and having, I mean, a timeline, having to do something in two weeks. What? I don't have five months to explore. That. <laughs> <That's crazy. laughs> um, so yeah. Yeah. I find students also really want to see examples right? Because you have an idea in your head and they have no, they can't see what's in your head. And so showing examples is, is really important, uh, and especially of other student work, you know, examples that they can achieve. Um, and I, someone else mentioned uh, international students and how to create your, make your classroom inclusive and build the confidence of international students. 
So I wonder if anybody wants to comment on that techniques that you're using to storytelling, but also just inclusive teaching. If I may, again, I think that I, I wrote about, about that is the number of international students have grown and um, I see them in the classroom struggling. Sometimes they, I perceive that they want to talk or they don't talk at all. So I try not to put them on the spot, but somehow asking a question that where they can share their own experience where they are, where they are from. So the, the local students can learn from that experience. And then, you know, that person is going to struggle. I remember myself when I went to grad school here and I, my heart was pounding and you know, I was the only Spanish speaker, and the only foreigner whose native language was not English. <clears throat> and I would just, was like, yeah, just when am I going to, <laughs> I wanted to ask a question. And um, sometimes I just had to look at my neighbor's notes in order to say, what was that word? I don't understand. I wanted the person to have subtitles at the bottom so I can just keep, keep writing. So that's what I, what I do is uh, usually asking them something about their own practice, their own culture, their own background. And so that gives them the space to share something and then feel more confident in the future. Um, especially um, students from Asia, and I'm making a generalization, but the culture tends to be very respectful of their you know, elders or the person the, um, who is the, the instructor that it is in, uh, in the US. So also that has to, and I put myself on like, as an example. I said, I have been in your shoes. So I know what you're going through. Mm -hmm. Just be part of it. Be, yeah. If you make a mistake, be proud that you speak more than, than one language. A lot of people don't. So just empowering them, that has been my, my, my way. That's beautiful about being multilingual and for us to actually, for me, who's not multilingual, to acknowledge that and to, to publicly express my admiration, I think would be very helpful to students to feel that that was really valued. Also the courage to come here and study I am continually amazed by the courage of going so far from your home and being in this new place and with so many different customs and <laughs> weird politics. And so that's really helpful. Thank you. I, I can share this little story. The, my first week at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign where I went to grad school, I ran into this uh, classmate from South Africa who spoke English, of course, and then he looked at me and says, what's up? And I looked at the ceiling <laughs> because I had never been taught what's up. I was taught, how are you? Very well, thank you. And you, not, not howdy or not, you know, those, those colloquialisms, they don't teach you that in school. <laughs> so you make a fool of yourself, but if you, you know, just make it part of, of your experience, then you don't feel too silly. I also remind my students that as far as writing goes, most of my international students are much better at writing and grammar than most of my students who grew up in this country, but that's just me. <clears throat> it's so good to point those things out, you know, that builds confidence because it's you investing publicly your confidence and that makes the group you know feel that as well that's great i had I a i had a oh, question sorry um colleen i've heard you speak on the your experiences teaching like black students and the sort of cultural references that they're, they're bringing in before that just blew my mind wide open a couple of years ago um it, I'm really interested in Farah and Valentina, if you find yourself um, bringing we have a lot of like authenticity in our education and in, in, in our presentation of information, do you find yourself having those conversations with your students about like 
how you're interpreting their work versus what they're bringing to the classroom or even the references that you're bringing. Um, do you speak a lot on your like personal perspectives and cultural perspectives? Do you bring that to conversation? That question was for us. Yes, we're, sorry about that specifically. Oh, we're, we're actually not yet educators. Um, hopefully someday I mean, y'all yeah. I mean you you talk like ones I would say so. <laughs> <laughs> well done um do you find yourself doing that in the in the classroom then do you uh, do you bring yourself to the classroom in that way well we're I both, think we definitely um, did and I mean again that whole project oh sorry oh go 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 <laughs> Um, we're both first generation immigrants. That's actually one of the things we we discussed with Ellen in the beginning. If you remember the the four characters, um, that was another one of the points. Aside from aesthetics, we we also had brought up that it's not so cut clean of like the Asian woman, the Hispanic woman, the white girl, and coming from a multicultural home, speaking three languages in my home and. I mean, there's so many gray areas of like, yeah, it's not a, it's not so easy to like check the box of who you are and how you bring that to the table. I think we still, I mean, personally, I still struggle with that, like how much of my identity and my culture to bring um, to my workplace. And I think I tried to bring it in the classroom. I'm, I Unfortunately, I don't think it was encouraged or really well received back to our <laughs> frustration of kind of starting this project. And I actually remember one of the projects that I had worked on that I was really excited about, the professor I was working with was quite discouraging. And then after graduating and I was interviewing around, one of the creative directors who I had shown the work to gave me a list of references that he had like thought of from looking at that project and was like, wow, have you looked into this? That reminds me of this. And I just thought, could you imagine I had this while working on the project itself? Um, and yeah, I mean, back to the whole, like, say more yes and, and less no's. Like, I think it was hard for me to bring culture and identity to the table because the people I was working with were mostly these older, very traditional, like, white guys. And I just had this expectation of moving to Brooklyn, going to this art school. And I was so excited to be, like, surrounded by, you know, <laughs> um, yeah, an encouraging kind of environment. And unfortunately, I, I don't feel, at least when we were there, I don't feel that that was really encouraged. Hey, Gary, you've had your hand up for a while. Uh, do you want to ask your question? Sure, yeah, I had a couple thoughts. Um, first, one thing that, and maybe it's a confession, I don't know, but uh, I find that uh, my students actually don't relate to the people behind the design that we talk about they just relate to the design and or like maybe I don't do a well enough job talking about the people behind the design or digging into the history um so we'll talk about you know Bauhaus movements or you know like not so much like so and so did this and so and so did that mm -hmm. and so then it gets to a point where design is disconnected and they don't have people to relate to which is not great so I have to figure out a way to make that better um I do try and go out of my way with specific students like I think you're really going to like this designer check them out but I don't think I do a good enough job putting a face to creative movements like I should um and then I don't know if anyone else deals with that or not but then another thing I wanted to say was as far as students coming to class I think it's important um to talk them off the ledge a little bit um students who are maybe English as a second language or students who feel like the other, um, or even just students that are from the backyard of your school, they come they come to class and, as this like pile of clay and they're like, make me whatever I'm supposed to be, please. And instead you say, hey, uh, you're you and what you bring to the table is important. Let's add you into this, right? And so I think empowering people to know that who they are is useful and I'm just like sprinkling some stuff on it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, design has always been a sort of cultural experience, and it's what people bring to the table as, as you know, much more important than, you know, sometimes what we teach them. And the other thing you said, uh, Gary, about uh, students um, not connecting to design history, 
do you think do you think that sort of like within that moment and you know sometimes we never know the seeds that we're laying what the fruit comes later on i mean you know that that at some point you know after after they've gone through your class or they've graduated that that's when that connection happens that spark is like that's when it becomes the thing i mean i've always sort of struggled with that as well it's sort of like you know, am i giving enough or are they getting what they need and i think maybe it's that i mean some others can weigh in too yeah i'll say real quick um gary i love your kind of example of the students coming in and sort of wanting us to mold them into being designers and I think a part of my experience anyway is that a lot of my students and myself at a really young age, I didn't, I didn't know that I already knew things, you know, I didn't know that, you know, braiding was, you know, a, a, a design, you know, braiding hair or a symmetry or, you know, so that's why some of the earlier examples of, you know, uh, the R&B clothing that was oversized and learning about scale and proportion and the colors, Students already come to class knowing things. We just, sometimes I think our language when we're teaching design makes them feel like they don't know anything, you know, and that they're, they're learning design for the first time when they're hearing about, you know, um, whatever, you know, some, uh, you know, again, international design or whatever. You can say uh, Bauhaus. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> just say it. Or Bauhaus, yeah. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, I think it's a, a part, at least of what I've been trying to do uh, of empowering the students is letting them know that you do understand more than what you realize you understand, you know, and so sometimes our language has to sort of match, match that, you know, so. And that we can learn from them. Uh, yeah, that's what's been so inspiring to me. This whole project, you know, learning from you, Kalina, and from Farah and Valentina, and all the other authors of our project. That, like, when you undertake a big research project, the point of it is to learn new things, and it becomes, you know, official research when then you share that publicly. But what we've all been doing is like learning stuff we didn't already know. And you have to learn that from really other people and new sources is it's intense. And I think every person on this call is learning things you didn't already know <laughs> in order to, you know, make our classrooms more inclusive. Yeah, really quick. It also, Kalina, I totally felt that. I felt really incompetent my first few years at school because I felt like I had so much catching up to do as far as learning like what I, what I was meant to already know and what I didn't know because of my life, history, family, parents, career that had no relationship to design or the art world. Um, and it always made me feel like a step behind, even though, like you're saying, I had so many interesting other perspectives and other like information that I could have brought to the table. And then Puya, I read your comment too about how so many um, people coming into the States have the like yearning for learning the correct like Western culture. And like, I, and I, I still struggle with this with my own family and with my own parents where I'm like, we should be super excited about like this huge accomplishment. My dad's Iranian, by the way. Um, but yeah, it's so interesting because I feel that that's huge, like the, the desire to be like the correct kind of way in design or whatever, and especially starting out and being like, wow, I really don't know anything. I really have so much to catch up on, even though we all bring so much to the table already. Alberto, um, can you talk about your uh, thing that you put on chat about um design being too perfect and not being given a pathway and sort of that experience that you felt when you were in uh, education in college, has that changed for you now? I think he may have had to leave, but I may be- No, I'm here, I'm oh, here. Oh, you're here, sorry about that. I'm sorry. here. Um, you know, when, when I, went to, uh, I went to college, I, I had, you know, I had the opportunity, right, to attend a good college. And it was kind of like, oh, you went to one of the top ones. 
Um, but then they, they spoke about design as this one dimensional perfection. You know, design is this and you're gonna, you have to learn how to get there. Uh, but the problem is I'm coming from a completely different culture and still to this day, you know, I love it when somebody says, oh my God, you don't know him or hat. And in my head, I go, you fucker, you have no idea all the other references that I know. And you're not, you know, you're not being conscious here. And that's, that's the most offending thing that somebody can say to me, like, oh my God, you don't know X. And in my head, I'm like, okay, that's it. Five people that you probably don't know. And that's it. But the conversation keeps going. But that was my, that was my college experience. People coming to me and saying, oh my God, you don't know this. You have to do it this way. But nobody ever cared to ask me in my four years of college to say, what can you bring to the table? Who, what, name me one person that you know that we might all be interested. And I remember, you know, I took a newspaper design class. I redesigned my local paper and everything was in Spanish. And when I put it up in the pinup in the classroom, my other classmates complained that there was no way to see if my communicate, my use of typography was good enough because they didn't know if the content that was highlighted was correct. And, you know, in my head, I'm like, well, I, I speak three languages, you know, one, why, why am I getting criticized? As an educator now, I, I always ask my students to bring their story. And what I have found is that a lot of people don't want to. And, and, and they, feel, they feel like it's, it's an embarrassment in some cases. And, and like I wrote in the chat, I had never been called a minority until I got to college. And somebody said, oh yes, you probably got in here because you're a minority. And I was like, okay, well, whatever. So I remember calling my dad because he, he had gone to upstate New York as well. And he's like, oh, it's okay. They're going to say all those comments. Just ignore it. Keep doing your thing. But, you know, in retrospect, I wish I would have been more strong and be like, okay, let, let's really talk about this now. And so when I hear Farah talking about those professors that didn't give them the references or that woman professor who thought that their project was not valid, it gets me to my core because all I want is a little bit more empathy to say, I have other references, you have others, let's find a common ground. You know, let's find out, you know, you'll do that. And I think that in education, everything that we talked about today, if all of us, and even me, I, I have blind spots. So if I could be more empathic every day, I'm going to be a better educator and hopefully change the life of just one student. That'll be good enough for me that I showed somebody a path, so. Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, you know, all references are valid. All cultural touch points are valid. You know, there's not one direction. There's many directions. Um, anybody else have some uh, questions to, they'd like to ask the panel? I have just, can I pick it, like, Albert, that was so well stated. And, and I think I, I have a personal experience with checking my own privilege in the class and having a student tell me what their design was and like aesthetically i did not agree with this at all i i like my cultural background my references all of my knowledge was like this is terrible um and, and but he was very adamant about it he was a, a young black man and i said bring it to me show me the references show me the the information that you have to prove you know to, to make this work to an audience that doesn't understand, right? Because I, I, you're gonna run into this throughout your lifetime because of who you are, because of what you're bringing. And so you gotta be prepared to defend that, unfortunately for you. And he did, it was killer. He had the references, he nailed it every, every point. And I highlighted that, highlighted that work in like my capstone exhibition, right? Like this is, this is the thing y'all get on board. And I'm, so I'm wondering to, to the panel, um, it, how, like, where is this, uh, what kind of structures do you have to allow students to check you, to sort of, you know, prove to you or, or to themselves even that they have that knowledge and agency and that they can, do you, do you have that sort of built into your classroom at all? Or how do you communicate students can even do that, right? I mean, I, I think it really requires <clears throat> myself and, you know, m many people to just question your bias about what is design, 
right? That the word design is itself an exclusionary concept that created, you know, at a cultural moment in order to uh, create an industrialized, um, streamlined, marketing market oriented tool and that we just have to when you say oh that's not good design well you have to unpack that and and it requires just it's very difficult as but and I think Ilio I think earlier referred to how we, we are training students to go out into a workplace <laughs> where those standards of excellence and correct you know knowledge of the the language of design or what's being looked for. So it's a complicated question. I know we're running out of time. I see Diane has had her hand up. So maybe that will be our last comment, question, so people feel they can. Yeah, let's end with uh, Diane and then maybe Ellen, you could uh, wrap it up. Or Kalina. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so then. Yes, just kind of based off of that last one, I bring a lot of business into design. And so to me, it's about the user experience. It's successful if your audience is going to buy the thing. So if it is for um, that audience and it was that you might not have, you might not have bought that toothpaste, but it wasn't for you, then maybe we should have, like, we should really bring in real users. I had this with a kid who couldn't explain. He would just make choices and I said, I need you to explain your choices for me. And I said, I said, do you know any, it was like for a resort with kids for like the, where people would take their families. And I said, do you have somebody that you could ask about this experience? And he's like, oh yeah, my sister has kids. I was like, can you go talk to her? Can you show her and see if this thing? And he totally switched his thing. It, it was like something not family oriented to now it was like this friendly dolphin thing, you know, but it was, it's like, I mean, yes, I think there are some things, but that's where we're always pushing. My goodness, Davidson Carson was a great example of somebody who didn't necessarily know stuff, but he was pushing and pushing and pushing. And I think maybe you guys hate David Carson. Maybe you love him. I have no idea, but at least he brought that but again, it's about user. Like I remember a uh, Ray gun magazine where it was all Z Zaf dingbats. Like I did not read that article, but I was like, man, the people who did like, oh my gosh, they love that band. Are they really? Cause they spent the time, you know, deciphering what that Zaf dingback article is, but maybe we should bring users, the real people who are, they say is the audience and see if they would buy it. And I think that I do something like that in a class and it's just been a huge thing and a huge confidence builder for my students. The end. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for the uh, panel for uh, uh, sharing their wisdom uh, with all of us. I think it's been a, an incredible experience and um, uh, I think we're over the time limit now. So um, if anybody, uh, uh, I think this has been recorded. So, uh, you can uh, get a hold of that, and um, I think that's just been shared too, and some other things. So, um, thank you, everybody. Thank you. And don't forget, yes, please, everyone, because this was amazing. But don't forget, there's also more. So after you take a quick break, come back and join us in about an hour and a half. And we have another fantastic session, which is actually going to feature Diane Gibbs, who just gave us that last comment, um, along with a couple of other phenomenal um, designers. And they're going to talk about passion projects, side projects. So come back for that. And we'll see you in a little bit. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye.